Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, my name is Professor Dr. Avinash Dadich. I am the Dean of Institute of Legal Studies and Research, GLA University, Mathura. Dear students, today we are going to talk about a topic which is very, very important for any business purpose. Business is all about making good agreements because when you sell things, you buy things, you produce things. You know, you make lot of agreements with so many people, like you make agreements with your supplier, you, you make agreement with distributor, with your vendor, with the uh, people who are giving you different types of services and as well as to your consumer. Okay? So when you are making agreements, then obviously uh, you have to be very careful because whatever you write in that agreement and you agree on that agreement, that becomes the law on you. Okay, so, there is a law of contract, no doubt, there is a law that which defines the boundaries, but within the boundaries, whatever you write, so contract is your personal law, okay, created by two parties. So, you need to understand that how to make good agreements, when agreement is made, you know, what are the legal requirements to make an agreement and then we will talk about the sales of good act also. Okay. So, let us start. Introduction of Contract Act 1872. According to Section 2H of the Indian Contract Act 1872, an agreement enforceable by law is a contract. Okay, an agreement enforceable by law is a contract. Very simple definition. So, let us try to understand what is the agreement, what is the enforceability of the law and then finally, what is the contract. And contract is a combination of two elements there must be an agreement, agreement between two parties okay? and agreement must be enforceable by law, it means there should be some obligation. So, let us define what is agreement. According to section 2 e, every promise or set of promise forming consideration for each other that is the agreement and promise what is the uh, promise according to section 2 b, when a person made a proposal to another to whom proposal is made if proposal is assented there too. So, these are very simple definitions, but you need to understand there are they have some very deep meanings. Uh, if you understand them, then I think that will be easy for you to understand that what is not a contract. So, an agreement. Agreement is basically when you are promis, uh, promising someone to do something for a consideration. So, the word consideration is very important here. Suppose you make an, a promise to your friend that tomorrow I will come to your home for dinner or you come to my home for dinner and then tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening you say no, I do not want to do it. Then is it possible that your friend can go to the court and ask you to fulfill your uh, promise and saying that you know he has made an agreement with me that okay that we will do it, but no because there is no consideration. Consideration means financial part there has to be some money involved in it. Okay? So, if I say that okay, uh, tomorrow I will come to your home uh, cooking your dinner okay? and then you say okay, if you come to if you do this I will pay you 50 rupees. So, that is a consideration that is an agreement. So, if you ask me suppose uh, uh, professor can you come to my home and cook my dinner I said okay, I can come and uh, I will charge 50 rupees. So, then it becomes an agreement. Okay. And tomorrow if you break your promise, then I can go to the court and say that please ask him to fulfill his promise, promise means give me my money because I, I was ready to do my job, but he declined. In the same manner, when I say enforceable by law, so now I believe you understand the concept of agreement, there has to be some financial part involved in this uh, thing and that the financial part should be considerable for the both parties. Okay? 
So suppose like if I just say you okay, uh, please promise me that you will give me 20 rupees tomorrow and I say okay, but if I do not give you then that is not an agreement because then the financial part is not only from the one side, what I am giving you from my side no, nothing. So, when both parties are giving something to each other, one party is giving product or service, another party is giving some type of financial arrangement. So, then that will become the agreement. Second question is enforceable by law. Suppose if I say that uh, ask you to do something illegal work, I say okay, I will give you 100 rupees, you go and steal that uh, you know that car. Like if I ask you, okay, I will give you 1 lakh rupees, you go and uh, steal that car and then if you do not do it, can I go to the court and say, okay, we have made an agree uh, agreement because I asked you to do something and I was giving you that money, but you failed. So, in that scenario, the condition of agreement fulfills, however, that agreement is not legal, that agreement is not enforceable by law, you cannot enforce the you know uh, thief agreement in the courtroom. So, what is not allowed as the law in the law that cannot be the subject matter of contract law. So, we will see more in details, but just to try to understand that the basic understanding. Then offer according to section 2a when a person made a proposal when he signifies to another his willingness to do or to abstain from doing something. So, agreement is offer plus acceptance. So, offer when you say that you do it or you do not do it. So, when I am offering you something, you know, when I am asking you to do something or not do something, suppose if I say, okay, if you do not uh, break this car, like, okay, breaking the car is again illegal thing, but if I say, okay, if you do not do it, then I will pay you this money. So, even uh, money can be paid for not doing something, okay, like for example, uh, if I say that if you do this business, I will give you money. If you do not do this business in this city, like okay, you are running a very good business in a city and the another company comes and say, okay, we want to start our business. You say, why are you doing it? I will give you 10 percent of my profit if you do not come to this city for your business. Okay, So, then I am giving you that money for not doing something. Okay, So, uh, agreement uh, means offer plus acceptance. If the opposite party accepts the offer, then only it becomes the agreement. If you offer, but the opposite party does not accept your offer, then that will not be the agreement. Consensus ad idem. According to section 13, meetings of mind or identity of mind or receiving the same thing in the same sense at the same time. All contracts are agreement, but all agreements are not contract. That is very important all contracts are agreement like a contract cannot be formed without the agreement, but not necessary dot that all agreements are contract like suppose you if you make a friendship agreement with someone that is not a contract, because when I say contract it means that it should be enforceable by law. Okay? Your friendship agreements are not enforceable by law. Okay? So, please try to understand agreements and contracts are not the same thing all agreements are contract, but all contracts are not agreement. So, contract in an easy language now we can understand contract is agreement plus enforceability before the law. Okay? So, first there has to be some agreement and finally, there should be enforceability by the law. So, essential element of a valid contract section 10, first offer and acceptance, second intention to create a legal relationship, third consensus ad idem, fourth consideration, fifth capacity to contract whether see suppose you make an agreement you, you make a contract with a, with a minor or with a you know the person who is not capable to make the uh, agreement or contract may be some lunatic person, okay, some made person if you make a contract with him he does not have the capacity. If you make a contract with a minor, like suppose a minor, a, a kid is 10 years old, 12 years old and you make a contract with him without his parents approval or a return approval, then that is also not a contract. Free consent, that consent of that opposite party should be free, okay? because if you threaten someone, if you do a fraud with someone and then if you are receiving someone's consent, that is not a 
valid consent. Legality of the object, whatever the object like the you know the consideration, the object of the consideration should be legal. You cannot make a contract for illegal objects like you know uh, narcotics, drugs, alcohol, all these things which are al uh, illegal in nature. Okay, like alcohol is legal in some states, uh, but in some states suppose the alcohol is not legal like the Gujarat and uh, Bihar right now, they do not have a legal status for the alcohol. So, if you are making a contract about selling and buying alcohol in those states, so that does not fall the legality of the object criteria. And possibility of performance, there has to be some per, a possibility of performance. If you make a contract with someone that is absolutely impossible by the nature or by the le legal side, then that is also not valid contract and writing and registration. So, uh, contract can be verbal also, but it is always good that you make your agreement a contract in writing and if possible you register also your contract. Types of contracts, absolute contract, contingent contract, express contract and implied contract, we will go one by one. So, the, uh, even contracts are also different types of, so one need to understand under which category my contract is falling valid contract. If all the conditions are fulfilled, it is called a valid contract, contingent contract. It in a contract to do or not to do something, if an event is collateral does or does not happen. So, that is a basically uh, subject to something like if I say uh, tomorrow I can give you uh, this product subject to uh, rain does not come, you know because in, in the rainy season you cannot supply your product. Okay? Suppose you are selling a product which is not possible in a particular geography situation or in anything you know. So, in uh, like suppose nowadays lockdown is happening in, uh, in Corona, so maybe you can make a contract that uh, after one month I will supply you this product provided the complete lockdown does not happen. So, if the complete lockdown happens then obviously, you cannot do it. So, that is a contingent contract, express contract when contracts are either in writing or in oral. So, suppose <coughs> You are not making agreements in uh, writing, but you are just expressing you know your offer, he is expressing his in uh, acceptance. So, most of the time in, uh, uh, in business world, not in the corporate, typical corporate, but in the small businesses, contracts are made by express contract. Implied contracts, when contracts are neither in writing nor in oral, like we believe that contract is there, but it has not been in uh, any form oral or writing absolute contract, a contract which is not dependent on the fulfillment of any condition like if there is no condition involved then that will be considered as a absolute contract. Invalid contracts, void contracts is void ab initio, void means from the beginning it is illegal, it does not exist. Voidable contract, a contract which is valid until unless avoided by either the party. Okay illegal contract and agreement forbidable by the law, unforceable contract it is a valid, but due to some technical defect the contract becomes void. In that case defects are removed the contract is enforceable lack of the registration, lack of the signature and all these things. So, you need to understand there are four uh, types of uh, four uh, uh, you know criteria of contract, one is void. So, if you make an agreement a uh, contract which is illegal in nature. Okay. So, that contract is void ab initio from the beginning that is it is illegal, nobody uh, no party uh, has any right to enforce that contract. Okay. Some contracts are voidable, a contract which is valid until unless avoided by the other party. You make something maybe that is not illegal, but not accepted by the law, but it does not say that it will be illegal until and unless one party decides to disobey that contract. Okay. Other types of contract, executed contract, in a contract where both the parties have performed their obligation, there is a remaining nothing to perform. So, if, if the uh, all the performance, performance performances of the parties have been executed, that will be called executed contract. Executory contract, in a contract where both parties are yet to perform their obligation, 
unilateral contract in a contract one party has performed its obligation and other person is yet to perform his obligation bilateral contract in a contract where both the parties have performed their obligation bilateral and executory are the same and interchangeable offer according to section 2a when a person make person made a proposal when he signif signifies to another his willingness to do or abstain from doing something when you are giving the offer you are making it very clear that you want to do something or you don't want to do something okay so abstain from doing something is also an action you know you say that i will not do it i will not do this business or i will not uh, break this thing so that is also an a type of offer to the opposite party types of offer express offer when offer is given to another person either in writing or in oral implied implied offer when offer is given to another person neither in writing nor the oral specific offer when offer is given to a specific person it's not a offer like general offer the next one you are you are not saying that this offer is available to everyone you are making very specific offer that my offer is available to only those companies who are having more than 100 crore rupees turnover so any company which is having uh, less than 100 crore turnover they cannot respond to you general offer when offer is given to entire world at lr like you say okay i want i am looking for something to do and i am giving my general offer to everyone cross offer when both the person are making identical offers to each other in ignorance of others offer okay count cross offer that's a cross offer counter offer is when both the person are making offers to each other which are not identical in ignorance of others offer then finally the standing offer an offer which remains continuously enforceable for a certain period of time okay you make an offer that for the next 6 months i am ready to buy this product at this price so that's a standing offer anybody can come and fulfill the conditions of my standing offer and my offer will be accepted legal rules for offer offer must be given with the intention to create a legal responsibility that's very important if your intention is not to create a legal relationship you just want to give an offer for some scientific experiment or some other things that is not offer offer must be definite you know you cannot make a vague offer you have to be very very specific in your offer there is a clear cut difference between offer invitation to offer invitation to sell offer must be communicated if you don't communicate your offer you know you just believe that the other party uh, must have accepted without understand without communication that is not the offer mere statement of price is not an offer this is very important like suppose if someone comes to you say okay uh, what is the price of this product and you say yeah 100 rupees that doesn't mean that you want to sell it okay the other party cannot say that okay you told me the price of this house then it means that you want to sell suppose if someone is coming to your home or your property and say okay what is the price of your land and you say it's a like 50 lakh rupees uh that's not the implied offer you know the offer has to be very specific then you should if you say okay the 50 lakh rupees and i am ready to sell this property to you at the rate of 45 lakh rupees so that is the implied offer that's not, that's a very definite offer the offer has been communicated then only if the other party accepts okay again it doesn't become the legal responsibility of the opposite party to buy your land at that price because that's only the offer once the opposite party accepts your offer okay then only it becomes a contract an agreement and which is enforceable by law <coughs> let's talk about acceptance according to section 2b when a person made a proposal to another to whom proposal is made if proposal is assented there to it is called acceptance if you don't accept the offer you know you just uh, hear the offer and you move away then there is no acceptance and your silence cannot be considered as a acceptance acceptance must be given as per the mode prescribed by the offerer so the offerer says that if i am giving my offer the acceptance must come in writing so then it must be in writing if you are giving an oral acceptance then that will not be uh, considered as a acceptance 
एक्सेप्टेंस मस्ट बी गिवन बिफोर द लैप्स ऑफ टाइम और विद इन रीजनेबल टाइम इफ आई से डेट माय दिस फोर्टी फाइव लैख रुपीज ऑफर स्टैंड वैलिड ओनली फॉर थ्री डेज एंड इफ यू डोंट रिप्लाई टू मी इन विद इन द थ्री डेज ऑन द फोर्थ डे यू कैन नॉट कम एंड एक्सेप्ट माई ऑफर बिकॉज माई माई एक्सेप्ट माई ऑफर हैज बिन लैप्सड एक्सेप्टेंस मस्ट बी अनकंडीशनल सो इफ यू मेक ए काउंटर ऑफर एंड यू से ओके या आई एम रेडी टू बाई योर हाउस हाउ एवर इफ यू रिड्यूस योर प्राइस बाई फाइव लैख रुपीज लाइक आई एम रेडी टू पे यू ओनली फोर्टी लैख सो इन डेट सीनियर दैट इज नॉट एक्सेप्टेंस दैट इज मोर लाइक एन ए काउंटर ऑफर ओके सो दैन डेट विल नॉट बी कंसिडर्ड एज एन एक्सेप्टेंस एक्सेप्टेंस मे बी गिवन बाई एनी पर्सन इन केस ऑफ जनरल ऑफर इफ द ऑफर इज वेरी जनरल like you know you are not making any specific offer to anyone in that scenario you can uh, anyone can come and accept your offer acceptance must be communicated if you don't accept your communication the same thing as the offer you know you cannot uh, go and say okay yeah i heard your offer and i was interested and i'm i was ready to buy but then you sold your property to someone else that is a breach of contract no you can't do it because you have to go and communicate your acceptance to me so that i can understand that yes you are interested then only it becomes the contract mental acceptance is not acceptance or acceptance must not be derived from silence that's very important sometime people suppose you are going again and again to that person's property you are giving very good indications but you are not giving any uh acceptance unconditional acceptance and if i believe that your silence you know sometimes we believe that silence is the acceptance no as per the law uh, silence cannot be considered as a acceptance acceptance must not be precedent to offer like if you give a counter offer then that is not the acceptance now let's talk about the consideration because as i told you earlier without consideration no agreement can turn into a contract okay an agreement uh, agreement can exist uh, between friends between family but if you want to make it as a contract because when i say it, when it becomes a contract it means that if any party breaches that contract the opposite party can go to the court and ask the opposite party either to do their duty and like they you know the fulfill the obligations uh, out of the contract or pay the damages but in in the absence of consideration no agreement can be termed as a contract according to section 2d consideration is defined as when at the desire of the promisers or promisee or any other person has done or absent from doing or does or abstain from doing or promises to do or abstain from doing something such an act or abstinence or promise is called a consideration for the promise so if you do something okay if you do something in the expectation of getting something that is only considered as a, con a consideration when a party to an agreement promises to do something he must get something in return this something is defined as consideration okay so legal rules for consideration it must move at the desire of the promiser okay if someone is uh, giving the you know accepting the uh, offer he must have some consideration is in mind it may move by the promisee it must be past present and future consideration it's not necessary that we are talking about future consideration if i say okay if you do it then whatever money i uh, like you know like you have taken maybe 2 lakh rupees loan from me so that loan we will be waived off so that's a past consideration now in future or present in present or in future you are not getting anything but it can be past present or future consideration it need not to be edu educate and must it must be real not necessary that it should be sufficient like suppose if i say uh, that i am like suppose you say that i want to buy your land for 10 lakh rupees the maybe the real price of the land is 45 lakh rupees okay but the if the land owner is ready to sell that la property at 10 lakh rupees that will be enough for the consideration the the party cannot claim that okay no it was not sufficient sufficiency depends on the will of the parties okay 
and it must be real. You cannot give an imaginary consideration. You know, you cannot give, okay, I will give you uh, X, Y, Z, which does not exist in the market. Like, so suppose if someone says that after death you will go to heaven, okay, that is my consideration. No, that cannot be accepted. It must not be illegal, immoral, or opposed to public policy. If you give some immoral or illegal or opposed to public policy considerations, then that consideration cannot be uh, accepted. A stranger to contract. It is general rule of contract that only parties to contract can sue and be sued on that contract. This is known as doctrine of privity, relationship between all parties to contract. Okay. So, what we believe that who can file the case against whom? We cannot allow any third party which is not known to the contract uh, file case against each other under the contract law. However, there are some exceptions a trust or a charge. If there is a trust uh, is created, if there is someone who is the uh, legally in charge of something, that person is maybe not direct party of that contract. However, on the behalf of the trust or the charge, they can file the case. Marriage settlements, partition or other family arrangements, uh, estoppel, assignment of contract, contract with agent, convenient running with the land. So, these are the exceptions where the third parties, maybe not the uh, party of that contract, can also file the case against. Contract without consideration is void, exceptions like love and, uh, like for example, love and affection compensation for voluntary service, promise to pay at a time, completed gift, agency, charity, contract to bailment, no consideration, no account. So, this is very clear. Now, we will talk about the capacity to contract, that is very important. When I say capacity to contract, <coughs> following are the condition for a person to enter into a contract. First, he must be major, major means he must be adult like more than 18 years old then only he can enter into contract by himself or he can do it by uh, with the help of his parents or guardian. Second, he must be sound mind, you know, like he must not be a lunatic person, he must not be, it is not about stupidity, a stupid person can make the agreement or contract, lunatic, you know, mad people, the people who does not have sound mind, you know, maybe due to some medical health or some other issues, you know if they are facing some mental issues and as per the medical records, those people are not having sound mind. When I say sound mind is, they are not capable to understand the consequences or the nitty gritties of that contract or that agreement, that they, they are not, uh, kept, they do not have capacity to make a contract. And he must not be disqualified by any other law. So, if the law says, that suppose you are the defaulter and law says that in next one year this person cannot do any business in this market. For example, in SEBI they do it, you know, in the SEBI if someone is doing insider trading in that scenario, SEBI can ask that for the next two years you will not do any trading in this market. So, in that scenario if that person is making a contract okay, with anyone regarding the trading that that will fall under this category because he is not qualified to do trading by the law. So, he is not able to make any contract. Disqualified person, persons to enter into a contract, minor, unsound person, otherwise alien money, insolvent, convict, company, corporations. Okay. So, these are the people, they are disqualified. Okay. Minor. Because as you can see, a lot of uh, business are happening through the minors also. We want to do business through our kids. We want to give them legal property. You know, we want to create something good in their favor. So, how it happens? <coughs> According to Indian Majority Act, Section 3, minor is defined as any person under the age of 18 years. In the following cases, a person is said to be minor if he does not complete the age of 21. Any person under the Guardian and Wards Act 1890, any person which comes under superintendence of the law or legal representative. So, if someone is falling under these two categories, he will be considered major only at the age of 21. Otherwise, at the age of 20, uh, age of 18, so a person becomes major. <coughs> Rules governing minor agreement. 
an agreement with minor is void ab initio if you make an any agreement with a minor okay without fulfilling the other conditions that agreement is ab a void ab initio okay so that agreement does not have any legal value minor cannot be a promisee minor cannot ratify his agreement on attaining the age of majority okay so it's not like that first to make an agreement with a minor and once he becomes major then he can uh, say okay now i want to change the agreement okay or i want to do the agreement unsound person so in minor situation they can make an agreement with the help of their parents or their guardian okay because those are the people who are legally responsible uh, for that minor unsound person according to section 12 a person generally sound occasionally unsound can enter into a uh, contract when he is a sound mind so this unsoundness sometime is permanent sometime it's very temporary so in that scenario if someone is not sound at the time of the making the contract then only he will be barred from making such type of contract so like suppose someone is unsound during some period of the time maybe from i suppose like july 2021 to october 2021 he was under some medical supervision but in october 2021 the doctor declares that now he is good uh, he is a sound mind person so in december if he makes the contract so then uh, that person is capable to make the contract okay so we need to see at what moment he is making the contract and at if that moment he is having the sound mind then law doesn't prohibit it a person generally unsound occasionally sound can enter to ink uh, 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 when he is a sound mind person of unsound mind are lunatics idiots drunken or intoxicated persons okay so even someone is drunk you know it's not about the unsound mind that is only the, like the you know uh, lunatics but if someone is drunken completely drunk or intoxicated drugged in that moment he is he or she is not capable to understand the nitty gritties consequences uh, or considerations and all these things relating to a contract so at that moment if, if if someone is making the contract that contract will be void so suppose if you make an agreement uh, contract with someone who is intoxicated completely at that moment he is not understanding what he is doing and if you get his signature <coughs> on a contract that and next morning if he wants to uh, cancel that contract he can do because if he can prove that previous night he was intoxicated and obviously it's a matter of medical evidences whether on that particular day he was intoxicated or not contract based on free consent as i said that the consent is very important because the both parties are making their uh, own rules and regulations uh, regarding their businesses so the consent must be very very free section 13 of the indian contract act 1872 defined consent it means when two or more person are said to consent when they agree upon the same thing in the same uh, same sense Section 14 of Indian Contract Act defined free consent. It means consent is said to be free when it is not caused by coercion or as defined in the section 15, under influence as defined in under 16, uh, fraud as defined in section 17, misrepresentation as defined in section 18, mistake subject to the provisions of section 20, 21, 22. consent is said to be caused when it would not be given but for the existing or sub coercion under influence fraud misrepresentation or mistake okay so you need to understand that consent can be uh, not free also suppose like if i say about the under influence suppose if a boss is asking a junior guy that to sign the contract and it's very clear that he is the under influence of that person okay and then the person can claim that my consent was not free though i gave my consent but i was under the influence of that person and when i say under influence means like i was under the threat that if i don't sign this agreement or contract on his behalf i may lose my job also okay fraud can also be there if someone is giving you false promises and then you are believing on the false promises and signing the contract that can be fraud misrepresentation you believe that the other person is saying that 
uh, he is uh, Mr. X, but in reality he is the Mr. Y. So if he is misrepresenting himself, if he is misrepresenting the facts, then that can also be a case of not free consent. Key clauses find in the contract. When I say that when you make an agreement okay, or the contract as a business person, you need to read few very important clauses. The first is confidentiality. When two or more firms enter into a contract, there will be no doubt be a significant exchange of information in order for both sides to perform their contractually stipulated obligations. In light of the need to furnish certain information about each other's financials and business practices, it is imperative for the contract to contain a strongly worded confidentiality clause. This clause should preclude both parties from divulging any or any other information shared during the course of the transaction. So suppose now you are doing business with someone, then you are sharing lot of confidential business information with each other. Okay? And obviously when you want to win the contract, you, you, the other party also asks lot of confidential and sensitive information from your side and you also provide. So it is a long term association and you are sharing lot of financial data, information. So whatever the parties are getting that information during the contract that must be protected by the confidentiality clause. Otherwise, in future that opposite party can misuse that data. Okay? So, if you want to protect the sensitive commercial market data of your company, then you should read confidentiality clause very carefully. Force measure, this is very important. This phase force measure literally translates to the greater force like the act of God. This clause should also be included in the commercial contract as it can protect parties from circumstances that arise are beyond anyone's control. Like for example, currently this lockdown happened. So if you have made an agree, uh, contract with someone that okay, like suppose I am talking about March 2020. So suppose you have made an, a contract with someone that in uh, April uh, 10th, I will supply you uh, like 10 ton of this particular product. But then government introduced the lockdown, nobody was moving from one place to another place. In that scenario, that situation is beyond your control. So the opposite party cannot uh, force you to fulfill your contractual obligations because of the force major clause. Suppose war happens, some earthquake, some natural disaster, you know, these type of activities which are not uh, anyone's control. So, you should also understand the force major clause because it protects the uh, both parties. Termination triggers in a business things often do not occur as planned and thus parties must be able to cut and run as necessary. This section of the contract must clearly lay out the circumstances under which one or both parties may terminate the contract irrespective of the time left under the agreement. See contracts are just like gentlemen's understanding, see like frankly speaking, some people say that people make the contract so that they can break them, but that is not the objective of any commercial contract. In the commercial contract, both parties try to uh, make the certainty in their business. Like suppose if I tell you that I need 5 ton of your product every month like the raw material every month in my factory so that I can go with my production. So, if I make an, a contract with you for suppose 24 months at a fixed price, then I am very certain that for next 24 months I will get my raw material. Okay? And in the return I ask, I give you promise that I will give you suppose 10 lakh rupees per month for your product. So, in that scenario both parties are convinced that what they are going to get every month for next 24 months. So, that certainty is very important in business. However, the business are absolutely uncertain due to some uh, reasons, business reason, financial reasons and some any other reasons. Suppose you are not able to supply me raw material. Okay? In that scenario, I must have right and I must put some termination triggers clause in my agreement that if you do not supply the required material for next uh, suppose 2 or 3 months, then I must be able to exit from the contract. Okay, then you cannot say no, no, why you are exiting from this contract, you are breaking the contract. 
or if I am not able to give you that money for next 24 months like suppose after 3 months if I stop my payments then there has to be some clause in the agreement that if you do not pay more than 2 months then the contract can be terminated from my side and obviously you will pay your amount but you do not want uncertainty you do not want uh, confusion in your business so that is why termination clause is very important and then within the termination clause sometimes it is very important to mention the timing also that when you are terminating the contract you have to give a reasonable notice period to the opposite party. <coughs> that is another interesting point jurisdiction when the parties to a contract are located in more than one state or perhaps more than the one country it may not be clear which states law govern the arrangement. Therefore, commercial contract should always specify the state the law will have jurisdictions over the agreement so that it is perfectly clear which laws are applicable. Suppose laws are different in Gujarat, laws are different in Tamil Nadu and both parties are making an agreement. So, they need to be very careful that which law will apply, uh, where the case will be filed, whether it will be filed in Gujarat or in Tamil Nadu. So, uh, because see it looks good that we will not go for fight, but in case if you go for fight you need to understand suppose you are working for a company in Gujarat and the contract says that the jurisdiction will be in Tamil Nadu. So, you need to understand now you have to go to Tamil Nadu face the case and the laws will be very very different ok. A and for the international contract it, it, this is a this can be the case of different countries like the French and Indian if they make a jurisdiction that the jurisdiction will be the pa uh, of the Paris court and the law applicable will be the French law. As per the contract law this is very much possible because you can choose your law you can choose your jurisdiction. <coughs> it is not automatic it is not automatic like in other civil laws uh, rules are very defined that if you are situated in this area the local court will apply in uh, contract law you can choose your law you can choose your courts also. Dispute resolution even the most well drafted contracts are uh, you know go for the conflict. As a result it is for the utmost importance to clarify the parties plan for the dispute resolution in the event that is the issue arises. So, you need to understand maybe you do not want to go for litigation. So, first you say we will go for the mediation then we will go for arbitration and if the arbitration fails then only we will go for the civil litigation. So, this dispute mechanism you should also understand very properly. Damages in the light of the frequency of the contract breaches and in, in an effort to deter them it is also standard practice for commercial contracts to contain clauses related to damages. In general liquidated damages will be included which is uh, usually a predetermined amount that will be owned if one side fails to promote, uh, perform. So, like suppose if you are if you fail to give me 10 ton raw material every month then I can put a clause in damages that if you fail to do it for the first month you will be paying 10 percent of the penalty and if you do it for next month then you will be paying 20 months. So, you can fix the damages even in your contract. So, if something goes wrong by any party then the legal obligations are well settled even in your contract. Now, let us talk about the sales of good act 1930. Originally the trans, uh, transactions related to sales and purchase of goods was regulated by Indian contract act 1872. As separate act the Indian sales of good act came into force in 1930. The word Indian was removed in 1936 A applicability of this law is whole of India scope of sale of good act. This is applicable only on movable goods it is not on the immovable property movable in movable means like house is a immovable property, but a car is a movable property. A contract of a goods is a contract whereby the seller transfers or agree to transfer the property in goods to the prop, uh, buyer for a price. The term contract for sale is a gen generic term and includes both a sale of an agreement to sell. Basic of like comparison meaning sell when in a contract of sale the exchange of goods for money consideration takes place immediately. An agreement to sell when a contract of sale the parties to contract agrees to exchange the goods for a price at a future specified date like suppose you make an agreement to sell 
that okay I will sell you this house I am currently giving you uh, I am receiving only 10 percent of the amount and 90 percent of the amount you will pay me after 3 months that is an agreement to sell. Nature it is an absolute sell an agreement to sell is conditional you really do not know whether you will get 90 percent money or not within the period. Types of contract executed contract and executory contract in future they someone will execute the contract right to sell is buyer here is seller transfer of risk to the buyer remains with the seller because once you sell the property and if you do not get your money 90 days then you are owning the risk title title is transferred to buyer title is remained with the seller ok in the sale you transfer your title also you transfer your legal rights but here titles are not transferred until and unless the opposite party fulfills the remaining uh, obligations. Formalities of contract of sale offer and acceptance the same thing ok. Delivery and payments it is not necessary that the payment for the goods to the seller and delivery to the buyer must be simultaneous there can be made at different times or in installments as per the contract. So, in movable goods when I say a car when you know you are buying a car on EMI ok. So, you are not giving money on, on the same date, but you are promising that every month for next 60 months I will pay you x amount of money. So, till you complete your transaction you do not become the owner of the car the ownership remains with the bank or the financial institutions, but you can use that car ok. Express or implied the contract can be in writing oral or implied it can also be partly oral or partly written. Definition of goods the act defines the goods in section 27 any movable property except actionable claims and money ok. So, it is not about the claims or money stocks and shares they can also move from one place to another place they are not fixed to any property, but they are they do not come under the sales of good act. The growing crops standing timber grass the thing that are attached of forming part of land which is agreed to be uh, severed from the land before the sale. So, the growing crops you know obviously they are attached to land, but we know that ultimately they will be cut and they are movable goods they fall under the definition of goods. Types of good existing goods like the specific goods ascertained goods or unascertained goods future goods contingent goods ok. So, let us see existing goods existing good means the goods which are either owned or possessed by the seller at the time of contract of the sale specified goods these are the goods these are identity identified and agreed upon the time when a contract for sale is made for example, TV VCR car and all these things ascertained goods goods are said to be ascertained when out of the mass of un unascertained goods the quantity extracted for is identified and sell aside for a given contract. Thus, when part of the goods lying in the bulk as identified and embarked for sale such as goods are term ter terminated as certain goods like the uh, co crops unascertained goods these are goods which are not identified and agreed upon at the time when a contract for the sale is made like goods in the stock or lying in lots. So, suppose some goods are lying in the go down. So, you do not know how much is there even you cannot see it from you at the time of making the contract, but you believe that goods are there ok. Future goods section 2 6 of the act future goods have been defined as the goods that will either be manufactured or produced or acquired by the seller at the time the contract of sale is made. The contract for the sale of future goods will never have the actual sale in it it will always be agreement to sell you understand. So, agree it su suppose if I say that I will give you a 10 ton of uh, movable goods like the raw material after 6 months. So, at that moment I am not giving I am not transferring any movable good, but I am just making agreement to sell that after 6 months you will get it. Contingent goods these are the goods the acquisition to which by the seller shall depends and on the contingency which may or may not happen like for example, agriculture crops if I say ok this is my land this is my crop and uh, after 3 months I will sell you my mustard or maybe any other product agriculture product. 
you really don't know what will happen in during the three months if a natural disaster disaster happens you may lose your entire crops okay in that scenario that is a contingent course you really don't know whether you will get it or not five essential feature of contract of sale two parties subject matter to be goods transfer of ownership of goods consideration is price contract of sale may be absolute or conditional essential elements of a valid contract so contract law deals with the movable as well as the immovable goods but here we, when you are when you are dealing with movable goods then sales of good with good act will apply when you are talking about immovable goods then transfer of property act will apply tpa will apply so contract is an umbrella law and then we have separate laws for movable goods and immovable goods doctrine of caveat uh, emptor the doctrine of caveat emptor is an integral part of the sales of good act it translate to the let the buyer beware this means it lays the responsibility of their choice on the buyer themselves it is specifically defined in section 16 of the act there is no implied warranty or conditions as to quality or the fitness of any particular purpose uh, of the goods supplied under such a contract of sale however the buyer can shift the responsibility to the seller in, in the three following conditions okay so when you are buying a movable goods you know the buyer has to take the complete responsibility you know in whatever happens wrong with that particular goods suppose you go and you go to buy a car okay i just show you my car okay this is my car you want to buy the price is 2 lakh then now it's your responsibility to check whether my car is good or not i will tell you yeah my car is good at best of my knowledge my car is good okay but now it's your responsibility to go and check whether my car is good not good or not so in future if something goes wrong with my car you cannot blame me because this responsibility goes to you however you can transfer you can shift this responsibility to me if the buyer sh shares with the seller his purpose for the purchase the buyer relies on the knowledge and technical expertise of the seller and the seller sells of good so suppose in this scenario if i am the mechanic okay i am the mechanic i am taking the full resp i am claiming in my advertisement that my cars are good i have checked all the parts of the car like in second hand cars some companies are buying the second hand cars so they are taking the full responsibility that we have checked uh, these cars thoroughly there is nothing wrong in the car cars are in the fit shape so basically as a buyer you are relying on the technical knowledge and expertise of the seller in that scenario if something goes wrong then you can blame the seller but as a layman suppose if i say okay i am not expert in car i am just a layman i believe that this car is running very well because i am driving but i really don't know what is wrong in the car inside you know maybe there is some problems which i am not able to understand or maybe there are some problems which will occur after few months you know in that scenario you cannot blame the seller exception to the doctrine of caveat fitness of the product for the buyer's purpose goods purpose under the brand name goods sold by description goods of mercantile quality sell by sample uses of trade fraud or misrepresentation by the seller so these are the standard exceptions so <coughs> my dear students what i was uh, trying to explain you through two laws contract laws and sales of good act so in the contract law they talk about generic idea of contract okay so there are few uh, things to understand very clearly first contract is the law of the parties okay when two parties wants to trade something then they create their own rules regulations and the entire ecosystem it's a free will of the parties okay there is no one who is forcing them to make a contract if there is any force any fraud any threat any misrepresentation that contract is not valid that contract will be voidable okay you understand voidable here that if i say that at that moment uh, i was under force i was under threat that's why i signed the contract but now after 2 months i want to withdraw from this contract because now i want to exercise my legal right and you go to the court and say that this guy threatened me that's why i signed this contract 
that it will become the voidable contract okay and second condition whenever you are making the contract with someone you need to check whether the opposite party is capable to contract or not like the minors lunatics idiots and the people who are intoxicated they are not capable to sign a contract okay so whenever or some people who are not allowed by the law to sign the contract okay so like for example in a company they have given special power to some very senior officers only to sign the contract so if a junior person is signing the contract the company will not be responsible okay so you need to understand very carefully that contract is very important for businesses and if you understand the important clauses in the contract one thing because you are doing only business you know you don't want to understand the too much legal side but if you go deep drive to those agreement clauses then you will understand that those clauses are directly affecting your business decisions like for example as i mentioned a uh, jurisdiction so in the jurisdiction if i say that the matter if something goes wrong you have to go and file the case in suppose outside of india or in other state then obviously you don't want to do it okay so you need to understand the nitty gritties of the contract how a contract is made what is the offer what is the acceptance what is the consideration capacity to make a contract and finally the agreement clauses the second part sales of good act in some businesses where you are dealing with movable part movable property then how agree uh, how agreements are made and what is the difference between agreement to sell and agreement okay when there is an agreement to sell it's a like a future promise that you will do something or you will not do something so you have to make a difference between agreement to sell and agreement under the sales of good act so i hope this lecture has given you enough uh, understanding uh, what is the contract law why contract law is important for your business and believe me most of these clauses are very common you will see those clauses again and again in all types of contract so once you try to understand those clauses Uh, through your legal team you know you can go and talk to your law professor or you can talk to your legal manager and tell him that i want to understand these clauses they are written in a very legalistic language so please explain me in simple english and tell me how these clauses can hurt me in my business or how i can use these clauses for my business strategies and decision if you are able to do it the contract law will act in your favor thank you very much Thank you.